<laughs> and most of the scripture this morning will be on the screen, um, but I will read um, several verses from Romans chapter 6 if you want to go ahead and just kind of open your Bibles there. Romans chapter 6, but we're taking a break from Jeremiah to talk about freedom since um, you know, Juneteenth happens every year, but, but July 19th doesn't happen on Sundays, uh, but once every uh, several years or so. And so it's fortunate that today we're in church on Sunday, and it's the actual day of Juneteenth. And so the title of the sermon is Freedom, the Juneteenth Sermon, Freedom. On June 19th, 1865... Uh, that's 157 years ago, if you want to. I, I did the math this morning because I thought, I wonder how long ago that was. So 157 years ago today, on June 19th, 1865, Union Army General by the name of Gordon Granger uh, rode into Texas. Now, uh, Granger had, there's a, um, a local connection here. If you go to Pinkerton Park, there's a fort, uh, mainly a dirt fort, uh, but there's a fort behind Pinkerton Park called Granger Fort or Fort Granger. And it's named after this uh, Union general who was here uh, in Franklin with the Union Army, but then at some point uh, started heading down uh, to Texas. And you know, th this is all a side note, but it's amazing to me. I mean, you know, I grew up in Nashville, and um, you know, we go to Fort Nashboro and, and, and different things like that, but not really uh, study history all that much, local history. But, uh, but over the last several years, you know, Franklin is a very historical town, and we get lots and lots of tourism dollars of so people coming from all over the world, literally, to come to Franklin to see the battlefields and things like that. And so, and so when I began studying more of our local history, it's amazing to me how much U.S. history is wrapped up in this little bitty town called Franklin, Tennessee. You know, the, blood, the bloodiest battle of the Civil War. Um, you know, basically after the Battle of Franklin, the war was over. Uh, basically after this battle, it took a few more months to wrap it up, but it was basically over. Uh, Andrew Jackson came to Franklin at the Masonic Lodge downtown to sign uh, the predecessor to the Trail of Tears, uh, moving the uh, Native Americans out of, um, uh, of this area so that they could bring in cotton and increase slavery, all right here in Franklin, not far from us um, in, uh, in Columbia. Um, uh, oh, shoot, I, I forgot. This is all off the cuff, so I've forgotten his name, but he's a Supreme Court Justice, first African-American Supreme Court Justice, but he's a lawyer first. Jerry? Thurgood, thank you, Thurgood Marshall. Thurgood Marshall, when he was a lawyer, went down to Columbia uh, to fight for some inequality that was going on, and, they, and this was in probably the 50s, I think, maybe, maybe the 60s, um, but they wanted to hang him, and so he fled and came to Franklin that night to spend the night, and so, in a sense, the birth of the Civil Rights has at least a little bit here, and then, of course, Juneteenth with, with Fort Granger. It's amazing how much U.S. history uh, has run through, I mean, key events has run through this little city. But anyway, so on April 19, 1865, um, General Granger went in um, to Galveston, Texas to read the Emancipation Proclamation proclaiming freedom for the enslaved people in Texas. The reason that's important is because Texas was the last state of the Confederacy with institutional slavery. And so in a sense, it was the last state to get the word out that the, that, that the enslaved people had been freed. And so as a result, June 19th has officially become known as Juneteenth National Independence Day. Now, Texas started celebrating that pretty quickly after it happened. But over time, different states did, and eventually it became a federal holiday, a Juneteenth National Independence Day or Freedom Day. But there's more to the story uh, than that. There's really more to it. So let me just give you, just uh, as background, just a little bit of history of June 19th. And so June 19th, Juneteenth did not mark the end of slavery. You see, Juneteenth marks the day in 1865 when a group of enslaved people in Galveston, Texas finally learned that they were free from slavery. Now, President Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation on September the 22nd, 1862. In the middle of the Civil War, he set enslaved people free. And so the Emancipation Proclamation was signed September the 27, 18, 22nd, 1862, um, but it did not go into effect 
until January the 1st, 1863. And so this is where in the African American community, and, and you know, when I was growing up um, in our churches, we would have uh, watch night services, but it was really just a chance to eat and fellowship and, and stay up all night. But in the African American church, white, the watch night service has an incredibly important meaning because they, would, they got together on, I guess it would be uh, December the 31st, 1862, and counted down the clock because when the clock struck midnight, January 1st, they were free. And so that happened in 186, that happened in 1863. And so the enslaved people in Galveston, Texas were freed January the 1st, 1863. But they did not know they were free or they did not experience their freedom for two and a half years. Are you following me? For two and a half years, they were enslaved even though they were free. That was good timing. The Emancipation Proclamation reads in part, On the first day of January in the year of our Lord, 1863, all persons held as slaves within any state or designated part of a state shall be then, thenceforward, and forever free. And the executive government of the United States, including the military and naval authority thereof, will recognize and maintain the freedom of such persons and will do no act or acts or repress such persons or any of them in any effort they make for their actual freedom. And so on January the 1st, 1863, the proclamation changed the legal status under federal law of more than three and a half million enslaved African Americans in the Confederate States changed it from enslaved to free. That meant as soon as a slave escaped the control of the Confederate government, either by running away across Union lines or through the advance of federal troops, that person was permanently free. Now again, in Franklin, we have a courthouse, the historic courthouse, in front of that courthouse is the statue of the USCT soldier. But part of this story is that in the basement of that courthouse, because that courthouse was standing during the Civil War, in the basement of that courthouse was a provost office. And so come January the 1st, 1863, any enslaved person in this area, and my understanding is that some came as far as 500 miles away. If an enslaved person could escape his plantation, and make it to that basement in that courthouse in our city, he was free. And then he turned around to join the military and to fight with the USA to free everyone else. January 1st, 1863. And so what Juneteenth teaches us is how freedom was remarkably delayed for people who were enslaved in the deepest parts of the Confederate South. For example, for, for political purposes, and, and you know, there have been books written about this, but for political purposes, while the proclamation that Abraham Lincoln signed legally liberated millions of enslaved people in the Confederacy, for some reason Lincoln exempted the union loyal border states of Delaware, Maryland, Missouri, and Kentucky. And so in those states, because they supported the union, they could still have slaves. After the slaves had been set free. A year later, in April 1864, the Senate attempted to close that loophole by passing the 13th Amendment, prohibiting slavery and involuntary servitude in all of the states. And so the declaration was signed, but it was a year and a couple months later before it applied to every state in the Union. But that amendment uh, wouldn't, wasn't enacted until December of 1865. In other words, it took two years for the emancipation of enslaved people to materialize legally. And then it took another six months before the enslaved people of Texas were set free. 
Then on June 19, 1865, Major General Gordon Granger of the Union Army arrived in Galveston, Texas and issued General Order No. 3 that secured the Union Army's authority over Texas. And here is in part what General Granger said. The people of Texas are informed that in accordance with the proclamation from the Executive Office of the United States, all slaves are free. This involves an absolute equality of personal rights and rights of property between former masters and slaves and the connection heretofore existing between them becomes that between employer and hired labor. And then it goes on. And, and basically, even though he said you are free, the rest of his speech made it clear that that freedom had strings attached. In other words, Granger told the enslaved people, you are free but we want you to stay at home and quietly go back to work for your master and he's going to pay you a little bit. He said, you are free, but you cannot gather in large groups, especially gather in large groups in front of any military installation. And so even then, they were set free, but their freedom had strings attached to it. Then during Reconstruction, which is approximately 1864 to 1890, black Americans made progress through the ratification of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. These amendments gave black Americans freedom, the 13th Amendment, due process, the 14th Amendment, and the right to vote, the 15th Amendment. But then, under political pressure, again, President Rutherford B. Hayes withdrew Union troops from the South. The last of the troops he came out, he withdrew from Louisiana in April of 1887. And when he withdrew the Union troops from the South, Reconstruction, which was a positive experience in our country, stopped and you had the beginning of the Jim Crow era and the revival of white supremacist policies that continue even to the present day. Now, Here's the point of that history lesson, at least for our purposes today. <clears throat> Go ahead. Here's the point. It is one thing to be set free. It is another thing to experience that freedom and to live out that freedom. So the enslaved people were set free. But it took two and a half years for that to become a reality. And in reality, once you entered the Jim Crow era, it, it, it still wasn't complete freedom. Now, the same thing can be said for us spiritually. So let's talk about our freedom. Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse 36, so if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Now the word free and the word free, the Greek word, means to liberate. It means to exempt from liability. And in the context of Jesus' words and the verb tenses of what He means, what Jesus is saying is that your liberation is final. If the Son has liberated you, you are liberated indeed. It is, it is final. It is established. It is done with certainty. In other words, in Christ, you have been set free right now. It's a done deal. You don't have to wait two and a half years to experience the freedom that you have in Christ the moment you accept Christ. At that moment, you are free. It's complete and it's done. And in Jesus Christ, you don't have to continually to fight for your freedom. And so in Christ, you are free. But in order to be set free, that means you had to be in bondage. And so, what has Christ freed us from? Well, three things, at least. First, in Christ, you are free from the power of sin. Jesus said, and this is kind of in the context of, of John 8, 36, if you go back to verse 34, um, Jesus said, I tell you the truth. 
Anyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now, Jesus said that's the truth. Okay? And so, sin is not a mistake. It's not a character flaw. Sin is serious business. And Jesus says that everyone, if you've ever sinned, which is all of us, right? I mean, look at your neighbor and say, you've sinned. I know it. I know you really well. You sin a lot. And so Jesus says, if, if everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now, a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you are free indeed. You see, the power of sin is that it entraps you and it enslaves you. Sin deceives you into believing that freedom is doing whatever you want to do. I mean, that's what we, you know, I, nobody can tell me what to do. I want to do whatever I want to do. And somehow or another we think that's freedom. And sin deceives us into that without realizing or we, don't, or we ignore it that if we continue down that life of just doing whatever it is we want to do, eventually we, we become a slave to that sin. I mean, just talk to people who have addictions. It controls them. They're a slave. And it could be addiction to a substance, or it could be addiction to money, or it could be addiction uh, to sex, or it could be addiction to materialism, or it could be addiction to fame or power, whatever it is. Once that addiction hits you, it controls you. You are no longer in control. You, you are a slave. In other words, apart from faith in Jesus Christ, you do not have the freedom not to sin. But in Jesus, for the first time in your life, you have the freedom not to sin. Does that mean you're going to be sinless? Well, in this life, no. But the, the, chains, the, the chains have been broken. You have been set free. You don't have to do that anymore. You're free. Paul said, for we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of Christ, so that, so that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. I want to read the rest of that passage. So look at, at Romans chapter 6, and I want to start reading in verse 8. Paul makes it clear, you have been set, we are not slaves to sin, we have died to sin, we have been set free. And then he says in verse 8, now if we die with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. Verse 11, in the same way, count yourselves dead to sin but alive to God in Christ Jesus. You have been set free. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body uh, so that you obey its evil desires. Therefore, for the first time in your life, you have the ability through Jesus Christ to break that addiction, to break whatever it is. You don't have to let sin rule in your life anymore. Do not offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer the parts of your body to Him as instruments of righteousness. Look at verse 14. For sin shall not be your master because you are under law, because you are not under law, but under grace. In Christ we have been set free free from the power of sin, but second of all, free from the penalty of sin. Paul said in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. You see, when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, not, all, not only are we free from sin's power, we are free from the penalty, from the penalty of sin. And here's how free we are. We are not only free from the penalty of our sins, Jesus doesn't even put us on probation. It's not like Jesus says, I'm going to forgive you of your sins, but you know what? For the next three years, I'm going to watch you really, really closely. You've got to check with me the regular time, and if you mess up one time, you're going back under the penalty. 
That's not what Jesus says. Because of Jesus and because of what He has done, your sentence for your sins has been flattened out. You are no longer held responsible for it. The penalty of your sin is gone. So in Jesus, we are free from the power of sin. We're free from the penalty of sin. And third, Jesus has set us free from the shame and guilt of our sin. Now, have you ever experienced shame and guilt over something that you've done? Or have you ever repented? You know, you go to God and say, God, forgive me of my sins. Have you ever repented but felt like you needed to repent again and again and again and again because you feel so bad for what you've done? Have you ever thought, God didn't really forgive me? Or, you know what, I've I've messed up so many times, I've done so many bad things that God cannot forgive me. So have you ever thought you were beyond forgiveness? You see, this is one of the biggest weapons that Satan uses to try to keep us enslaved, to try to keep us from living out our freedom. Jesus has set us free, and then, and then the devil comes in and says, no, 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 you're not, stu- you're not really free. You can't do that. You know God didn't do that. You know you're no good. And he keeps us in bondage because of our shame and our guilt. That's like an enslaved person who has been set free but doesn't know it yet or an enslaved person who has been set free but doesn't believe they are worthy of that freedom. And so again, Paul said, and this is one of my favorite verses in the Bible, Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Other people may condemn you. Other people may not forgive you. But when you ask Christ into your life, He forgives you so completely. He has forgiven you from the power of sin that you no longer have to live that way. He has forgiven you of the penalty of sin and He frees you from the shame and the guilt of that sin. And He says there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So, Jesus has freed us from the power of sin, from the penalty of sin, and from the shame and guilt of sin. When we understand what Christ has freed us from, then we can live out what Christ has freed us to. So what has He freed us to? Well, first, Jesus has freed you to live an abundant life. An abundant life. Jesus said, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Jesus has set us free to experience a life that is full of love, joy, peace, contentment, and adventure. Does that mean you'll never have ups and downs? No, no, that means you're going to have a lot of ups and downs. But, in, but as you are having those ups and downs, there is love, joy, peace, contentment. An abundant life. A full life. Listen, if you never really want to be bored in life, just commit to following Jesus completely. You'll never be bored a day in your life. Is it all good? No, but it's abundant. It's full. It's love. It's peace. Jesus has set you free to live an abundant life. But Jesus then also sets you free to love. To love. And really, that's a big part of the abundant life, is loving people. Especially loving people you may not necessarily like. Or loving people who don't necessarily love you back. Jesus gives you the freedom to do that. Jesus said this, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hinge on these two commands. People say, Kevin, what does God want me to do? Well, it's really simple. Love him and love others. And as we love others, Jesus reminds us that part of what the others mean is Love your enemies. 
and pray for those who persecute you. Now that's a tough one. But Jesus Christ gives you the freedom to love. He gives you the freedom to have an abundant life. And third, he gives you the freedom to serve. To serve. Paul said in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Jesus has set us free to serve. Now that sounds counter. Um, freedom means I can do whatever I want to, doesn't it? And Jesus said, no, freedom means you serve. Just like the USCT soldiers escaped slavery to only serve in the Union Army. And many of them escaped save slavery to serve in the Union Army and then were killed in battle. But that's freedom. Freedom to serve. Which is why we say this. The way you love a God you cannot see is by loving those you can see. The way you serve a God you cannot see is by serving those you can see. Jesus has set you free from the power of sin, from the penalty of sin, and from the shame and guilt of sin. And he has set you free to live an abundant life, to love, and to serve. So, think about this for just a second. Abraham Lincoln signs the Emancipation Proclamation on December the 22nd, 1862, in the middle of the Civil War. The proclamation didn't go into effect until January the 1st, 1863. But when it went into effect, it freed over three and a half million enslaved people. But it took another year for all that to apply to every state. And then it took two and a half years for all the enslaved people to be set free. The last ones being in Texas on June 19th, 1865. But it would be years and centuries later before every state recognized Juneteenth as a holiday and before it was made a federal holiday. Can you imagine if July 4th happened and we didn't make that a holiday for 150 some odd years? On June 17, 2021, President Joe Biden signed a bill <clears throat> making Juneteenth a national holiday over 150 years from when the Emancipation Proclamation was signed. On that day, President Biden said, I hope this is the beginning of a change in the way we deal with one another. And we still saw how much work we got to do when in Franklin, Tennessee, you're celebrating Juneteenth, but a white supremacist group comes to try to protest the celebration in Franklin in 2022. Dee Evans, the National Director of Communications on the, of the National Juneteenth Observance Foundation said, when the bill was signed into Congress. In 1776, the country was freed from the British, but the people were not all free. <clears throat> June 19th, 1865 was actually when the people and the entire country were actually free. But yet, if we're honest, in 2022, we are all free, but some of us are more free than others. There's still work to be done. But can you imagine being set free from slavery and not knowing it for two and a half years? And during that two and a half years, you lived as an enslaved person even though you were free? Can you imagine that? Can you imagine being set free but still living in bondage? 
But yet I suggest to you this morning, there's a lot of us Christians who've been set free, but we still live in bondage. We still let sin direct our path. We still give in to that addiction. We still give in to that lust. We still give in to that desire for more and more and more. We have, Jesus has set us free, but we live like we are still enslaved. In Christ, you have been set free. Completely free. Now, Live like it. Live like you have been set free. Don't give in to the passions. Follow the Holy Spirit. And the Bible makes it clear. The more we fill ourselves with the Spirit, the more we have the power to live out the life that Jesus wants us to live out. You have been set free. Now live like it. Let's pray. Father, once again, we just say thank you for this day. And Lord, I pray as we sing this song of commitment, we're reminded that you paid it all already. You have set us free. Lord, whatever it is that is holding us down, whatever it is that is keeping us in bondage, be it um, emotional, physical, spiritual, financial, relationship, Whatever it is that is keeping us in bondage, Lord, may today we proclaim that in Jesus Christ we are free. There is now no condemnation for those of us in Christ Jesus. Help us, Lord, to live out the freedom that you have paid for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and sing this. Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small, child of a weakness, watch and pray, find in me your all in all. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Lord, indeed, oh, now I find thy power in thine alone can change the leopard's spots and bear. Jesus paid it all, all to him my own. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it away. Jesus paid it all. Father, one final time, we just say thank you for this day. Thank you for speaking to us. Thank you for uh, this time of worship that we've had together. In Jesus' name. Let's say our prayer for the, for the year. You can get out of your way so everybody can see it. But say this with me. May the peace of the Lord Christ go with you wherever he may send you. 
May he guide you through the wilderness, protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. You're dismissed. <laughs>